Hello there. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Depending on wherever that you are watching from right now, welcome to another session of APAC Innovate. Over the next 30 minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how to scale to the first 10 million users of your web application. And by way of introduction, my name is Shantanu Dutt, and I run the solutions architecture team for the West of India, based out of Mumbai. I've been here on board AWS just over six years, and I've loved every bit of my stint here. And one of the reasons that I've enjoyed my time here is customers like you, who bring along various innovative use cases to run on AWS. And those interactions have been fun and interesting. My Twitter handle is also right up there for you. So if you want to connect with me, or if you like something from my session, then I'm happy to connect with you on Twitter. Now, talking about scaling your application, that indeed is a very big topic with lots of opinions, guides, how-tos. There'll always be those debates among people around, how do I scale? Do I really scale horizontally? Or do I go the vertical route? Well, one easy way to scale is like this, right? Just clone the Hulk way of scaling and you can scale in a couple of seconds. But then what I would say there is it's an iterative process. You don't design for 10 million users right from day one, at least not always. And if you're new to scaling on AWS, you might ask yourself this question. So how do I actually scale? And if you're like me, you will start where I usually start, when I want to learn something new, which is using a search engine. And so as you can see here in this case, I've actually gone and searched for scaling on AWS as a keyword in my favorite search engine. And whoa, what do we see here? Clearly this will take us months if we go this route, going through those million pages of documentation and links. So, back to auto-scaling. Auto-scaling really is a tool and a destination for your infrastructure. It isn't a single solution that fixes everything. It's not just a checkbox that you can click when launching something. Your infrastructure really has to be built with the right properties in mind for auto-scaling to work. So I would again ask the same question. Where do we really start? Well, first let's ask this question. What is it that we really need first? And so what I would say there is we need some basics to lay the foundations. And we'll need to build our knowledge of AWS on top of it. So let's get some basics right. Some of you may already be aware of this. We actually have 16 regions across this planet with three more coming up in France, China, Sweden. Um, they have been already announced and they should be coming soon. Each of these regions have multiple availability zones or AZs as we call them in short. In addition, going on the infrastructure side again, we have 70 plus points of presence or edge locations globally as part of a CDN service called Amazon CloudFront. These are POPs acting as cache locations for some of your static and dynamic content. And we of course have all these service offerings that you see on this slide. And if you really look at it, AWS has over the years developed the broadest collection of services available from any cloud provider. There are these foundational services at the bottom like compute, storage, security, networking, which offers customers flexibility in their architecture. And then we also have those higher level managed services around databases, mobility, containers, deployment and management, data warehousing, and really many more. We have this entire spectrum of options to meet most price to performance ratios. So lots and lots of options there, but remember what I said at the beginning, that you don't need to plan for 10 million users right from day one, there's still time. So let's get started at day one then. Let's look at what day one looks like. So day one probably looks like this, where you just have one user, which is most likely say yourself, you're just using your own website in beta. This here is the most basic setup you would need to serve up a web application. Any user would first hit Amazon Route 53 for DNS resolution, and behind this DNS service is an Amazon EC2 instance running your web app and database on a single server. We'll need to attach an elastic IP so that Route 53 can direct traffic to our web stack at that IP address with an A record. And to scale this infrastructure, the only real option we have is to get a bigger EC2 instance. Now, 
Vertically scaling that one EC2 instance is where we have to go. To a larger one, uh, you know, scaling that instance to a larger one is the only approach, but it's a very simple approach at the beginning. If you look at it, there are lots of different AWS instance types to go with, depending on your workload. We group common instances into instance families as they have some characteristics which are similar. Some have high I.O., some are CPU optimized, others are memory optimized, and we have then those that are storage optimized. There are of course the T2 instance types which are capable of bursting based on your CPU credits. And you also have the latest generation of general purpose instances. Inside each of these instance families are different sizes ranging from micro in the T2 family to 8XL in many other families. This allows you to really scale vertically inside the family that best supports your workload. But, you know, this is all great at the beginning, but the key concern here is that you will eventually hit an endpoint where we just don't have a bigger instance class out yet. And so scaling this way, while it can get you over an initial hump, really isn't going to get you that far on the long run. And the second challenge here is a single point of failure. Because if that single EC2 instance goes down for some reason, you have all your eggs in one, that one basket and nothing else to take over the traffic uh, that's coming in. So, if we consider the next stage where the number of users are increasing with more than one, some of your friends have got the word about your web app and they're starting to come on your website. So you have a few users now, not just one. Now, first thing we can do to address the issues of too many eggs in one basket is to split our web app and database into two different instances. This gives us much more flexibility in scaling these two tiers independently. And since we are breaking out the database, this is a great time to think about maybe making use of a database service instead of managing the DB yourself. So what are the options that we have for those? At AWS, there are lots of different options to running databases. One of them is to just install pretty much any database of your choice on an EC2 instance and manage all of it by yourself. If you're really comfortable doing DBA-like activities like backups, patching, security, tuning, this could be very well an option for you. Also, if you need something specialized or custom and need to manage that hardware to achieve this, again, this could be an option for you. If not, and really doing all of those tasks that I mentioned, is really undifferentiated heavy lifting and nothing else. And if you really want to go the other route, then we do have a few options, like Amazon Relational Database Service, or RDS, as we call it, which gives you a managed relational database offering around several database options, like MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, Amazon Aurora, and many, many more. We also then have a choice of our NoSQL database, called as Amazon DynamoDB. And then we have Amazon Redshift, which is a fast, fully managed data warehouse. Given that we have all these options that I spoke in the previous slides, from running pretty much anything you want yourself to making use of one of the database services AWS provides, how do you really choose between SQL or NoSQL? So some folks won't like this, you know, but I would say start with SQL databases. And why do we do that? Well, generally speaking, SQL databases are established and well-worn technology there's a very good chance that SQL is older than most people out there watching their streaming right now. It has continued to power over the years the most largest web applications we deal on a daily basis. There's lots of existing code, books, tools, communities, and people who know and understand SQL. Some of these newer NoSQL databases might have a handful of companies using them at scale, and that's about it. Because people are key here. In addition to all those other points, you're going to need to hire people to manage your database. You also aren't going to break SQL databases in your first 10 million users. And yes, there's that asterisk or condition at the bottom. So my point there is, I again strongly recommend SQL-based technology unless your application is doing something spectacular and super weird with the data. Or you'll have massive amounts of data. And even then, SQL will be there in your stack somewhere. So now you're probably thinking to yourself, aha, you said massive amounts. We are the new startup and have the coolest app in town. And we'll probably have the massive amounts of data that you're talking about. Well, there could be a few of you that would need something like NoSQL at the start. Well, let's clarify that in a bit. If your usage is such that you'll be generating lots and lots of data in your first year, uh, terabytes of them, 
and it's really incredible and intensive workload, then NoSQL might be there for you. Uh, but that's an incredibly amount, a large amount of data, and most likely it doesn't go that way. So let's kind of go ahead now. Let's kind of look at the next iteration of your user base reaching more than 100 users now. So we're starting to see some workloads coming in, uh, in terms of the traffic. So for this scenario today, and based upon our discussion that we just had, just a few seconds ago, we're going to go with RDS and MySQL in that RDS instance as a database engine. This should really take care of the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, that we spoke about. So let's kind of go to the next iteration now, which is a little more than 100 users. Your, slide is, your site is slowly becoming popular, and the user base has reached more than 1,000 very, very quickly, starting from one user. So next up, what we need to do is address the lack of failover and redundancy in your infrastructure. We're gonna do this by adding another web app instance and enabling the multi-AZ feature of RDS, which will give us a standby instance in a different availability zone from the primary. We're also gonna replace our elastic IP with an elastic load balancer to share the load between the two web app instances. So now we have an app that is a little more scalable and has some fault tolerance built in. For those who aren't familiar with our elastic load balancer or ELB in short, that's a really highly scalable load balancing service that we have. We put it in front of an application tier where you have multiple instances that you want to share the load across. ELB really is a great service in that it does a lot for you without you having to do much of the heavy lifting. It will create a self-healing and self-scaling load balancer that you can load balance across the AZs in a region and do things like SSL termination, handle sticky sessions, and it's got multiple listeners too. It will do all of those health checks for the backend instances behind the scenes and remove the instances from service if they are unhealthy. This is a very key service in building highly available infrastructure on AWS. Right, -o. now continuing to move on, how do, your, how do your site now look like when it's becoming even more popular with more than 100,000 users now? Now we are starting to get a serious load on your website. So now what we'll have is have our Amazon Route 53 service pointing into ELB instead of the Elastic IP and ELB balancing requests across web instances. You can use the RDS master for writes and use something called as RDS read replicas for serving your read traffic. As you can see, the stack is fault tolerant and has scaled quite a bit from where we started off. Most of you will get to this point and be pretty well off, honestly. You can take this really far for most web applications. We could scale this over another availability zone maybe, add in another tier of read replicas, but it's still not that super efficient in both performance or cost. Since these are important too, let's try and clean up this infrastructure a bit. Now, how do we do that? We of course do that by offloading a few things from the main web app tier and kind of make it more efficient. For example, we can actually start by moving any static assets from our web app instance to Amazon Simple Storage Service, also called as S3. That was, by the way, our first AWS service that we released publicly way back in March of 2006. And then you can serve those objects via Amazon CloudFront. This would be all your images, videos, CSS, JavaScript, or any of the heavy static content files that you have. These files can be served by an S3 origin um, and distributed via CloudFront. Now, this will really take off a lot of your load of your web servers and allow you to reduce your footprint in that web tier, which is much needed. Now, additionally, we could use Amazon DynamoDB in this workflow to store session information from your web application. And for those who are wondering what exactly is DynamoDB, well, DynamoDB is a managed provision throughput NoSQL database all you really need to do is turn the crank on and tell us how many reads and writes per second your database needs. It has fast, predictable performance with really single digit millisecond latencies. It's fully distributed, by the way, and its fault tolerant architecture ensures that when you write to DynamoDB, you're writing data to multiple availability zones. We support JSON as one of the formats for items to be stored on Dynamo and much larger item sizes than we used to until some time ago. We could additionally then use Amazon Elastic Cache as a place to store common database query information for content that doesn't change often, like information on our user base or what is in their shopping cart and so on and so forth. 
we should try and do this as often as possible. So again, what is Elastic Cache, if you're asking? Elastic Cache is a hosted memcache DB or Redis instance. It does speak the same API as the traditional open source products. So think of this as memcache or Redis as a service where we manage the clusters for you. You can scale from one to many nodes, and this provides very fast single digit millisecond latencies as well. So now, this is what we have reached here so far. After offloading all that stuff from the main web app tier to other components that we just added, this is static content to S3 and CloudFront, all those session state contained on Amazon DynamoDB. The database scaling or caching option to Amazon Elastic Cache is stored in, in the memory, in the cache of Elastic Cache. And in fact, you could even offload some of the dynamic content to be served via Amazon CloudFront. Now that we have our web tier, which is much more lightweight, we can now go back and revisit the beginning of our talk, which was, if you remember, auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is the automatic resizing of application tiers or scaling of compute clusters of tiers so we can grow or shrink our web and app tiers as needed on demand. What you can do is just create a launch configuration which defines what in each instance you will look launch uh, what does it look like? This includes items like what is the AMI or Amazon machine image, what instance type do you want to use, any bootstrapping, etc. Next up, you could create an auto-scaling group. In this group, you define the minimum and maximum servers in the group, the AZs you want the tier to operate in, and the launch config name. And lastly, before you end, you specify your scaling policies with metrics or a schedule, and that's it. You're up and running with an auto-scale infrastructure and you can do this from the console or from a command line or API. So using all of what we have done so far, we've seen how we can scale from one user to all the way to 100,000 users. In fact, you could easily reach a million users this way. We'll see how so. If you go to more than 500,000 users, if you add an auto-scaling, our caching layer, the read replicas with MySQL, we can now handle pretty much a serious load there. This could potentially even get us into the millions of users range by itself if it's continued to be scaled horizontally and vertically. But remember, and if you notice, this is still a monolithic application. All of the application logic is running on each server. Can we possibly make this even better? Now you need to think of making deployments easy and very repeatable. To do this, you will need to add automation to your deployments. Uh, there are tools to automate deployment of AWS resources, uh, and there are other tools that manage deployment of your software and configuration of an instance. Lastly, you'll want to monitor your application and analyze what users are doing on your application. And this can really be done easily with metrics, logs, and even analytics. Note that it's very important to notice that managing your infrastructure will become an ever-increasing part of your time. I cannot reiterate this enough. Automate as much as you can, and use tools to automate repetitive tasks. And we've made those ready-made tools for you to be available at your fingertips, so it should be quite easy. Now, we spoke about tools. There are quite a few tools there, so let's discuss quite a few. Elastic Beanstalk is easiest to start with. Elastic Beanstalk really allows you to not worry about managing the infrastructure of your application. You simply deploy your app, such as a Ruby app in a Ruby container, and Elastic Beanstalk takes care of scaling and managing it. All you have to do is just push a button and you're there. Moving on to Opsworks, this allows you to manage the life cycle of your application in layers with chef recipes. We have out of the box recipes for managing many different types of layers and you can write custom chef recipes to manage any layers that we don't support as well. CloudFormation is one of those services which can be underrated really. It's one of my favorite services. It is basically infrastructure as code. It's basically a template and it's a, it's a template-based tool with its own language, so a bit of learning curve there, but it's very, very powerful. All you do is define JSON templates that define what infrastructure you want to build out and any relationships that exist between your infrastructure. And if you're wondering whether you could do all of these that I spoke about via tools, and if you're wondering if you could do them manually, yes, you can, of course you can. But at scale, it's nearly impossible to do so without having a huge team under you to actually do these tasks, and even then, it won't be very efficient. You know, recently we also introduced a number of services for storing your code 
deploying your code and even managing continuous delivery and releasing automate and release automation. These services are called code commit, code deploy, and code pipeline. And these really get you into the DevOps mode of operating and further help you with automation. So moving on, we are still in a position where we have a very monolithic application where all logic and functionality is running on the web server. We have a single web app tier doing all of our application workload. While that works for some sites and application, for many it doesn't. Which then brings us to our next topic, which is SOA. And what does this actually mean? I'll tell you what, it doesn't mean first. It doesn't mean sons of anarchy. Well, at least not in this presentation. It does mean service-oriented architecture, of, and hopefully that is what you expected. And once again, if you're like me, you'll start where I usually start when I want to learn something new, which is using a search engine. And so in this case, again, I've gone and searched for SOA on AWS in my favorite search engine. But whoa, again, just like the previous one when we were searching auto-scaling, again, this is not the place you want to start. That's a ton of links and web pages. Now, AWS has quite a few services that can solve key functionality areas in your application. Combining loose coupling, SOA, and even pre-built services can really have some huge advantages. Instead of you yourself writing all of these mini services yourself, just try and leverage some existing services and applications, especially when you're starting out. Do not try and reinvent the wheel because that's going to take a lot of time. For example, we have built services for bulk email, for queuing, for transcoding, search as a service, databases, even monitoring and metrics. Lean on other third parties for more. Remember, loose coupling different tiers of your architecture and using SOA gives you the ability to really move very quickly. And when services are loosely coupled, they can really scale and be made fault tolerant independently of each other. The looser the services are, uh, and the more they are loosely coupled, the larger they can scale. So design everything as a black box, build separate services instead of something that's really tight and interacting with something else, use common interfaces or common APIs within the components, and always ensure to favor services with built-in redundancy and scalability rather than building your own. You'll always be better served that way. Now we look at a million users. We finally reached the million user range. To reach a million, you'll want to iterate on many of the previous things such as use of multi-AZ, maybe use a third availability zone if you have to, use of elastic load balances between the different tiers to loosely couple them, and continue using the same SOA principles and services that already exist that are built to scale with you. You could offload your web tier by removing static content from the web tier and using caching in front of your static and dynamic origins. Ensure to cache in front of your database and use ready replicas whenever appropriate for your app reads or any offline reporting or analytics that you might have in your organization. Also, ensure to move your session state of your tiers that are auto-scalable, basically making them stateless. Now, if you look at this diagram, it's got a lot of components. It's probably missing the second and maybe the third availability zone. But you know what? There's only so much space we have on this slide. But as you can see, we have added some internal pools for different tasks, perhaps. Maybe using a simple queuing service for queuing. Maybe using simple email service for sending outbound bulk email. We may have Amazon AWS Lambda caching events or items from S3 and Dynamo for processing them for event triggers. We're using caching for the database and have built stateless tiers for our web and app tiers. Again, our users will still continue to talk with Route 53 and then to CloudFront to get our site and our content hosted on the backend by an ELB and S3 service. So what are the next big steps that we need to think about? This is where we are. We are at 10 million users finally. That was our goal for this session, if you recollect initially. That was the topic of our session. And so when you start to get into the 10 million user range or even 5 million user range, we may start seeing database contention issues on rights especially to the master database. And the way to solve these types of issues is by federation and sharding. Because by doing the split horizontally, you're helping scale the number of requests to your database multiple x times than what it would be with a single RDMS. Of course, as and when you can, you could move some of the functionality to other databases like NoSQL or graph databases and so on. And when splitting this database, it also does require making some amount of changes to your app layer to align to the horizontal split of the database layer. So be mindful of those if you haven't done this before. All right, 
That went pretty fast. Now let's do a very quick review uh, before we end. So what I mentioned was always ensure to use multiple availability zones in your infrastructure to build in redundancy. Uh, use two, maybe three availability zones at the beginning if you like. Always make use of self-healing and self-scaling infrastructure. And use services like ELB, S3, simple notification service, simple queuing service, Lambda, or simple email service for bulk mailing. Build in redundancy at every layer of your application. And then start with SQL for your database. I mean, seriously, I've reiterated this before as well. Do not try and make it too complicated and reinvent the wheel from day one. Try and cache data both inside and outside of your infrastructure with the techniques that we discussed and use automation tools in your infra to deploy applications and make it repeatable. So use automation as much as possible. You should also make sure that you have instrumented your application so you know what's going on. Use the usual SOA principles to split things into separate modules and reuse services that are available when you can. Take advantage of auto-scaling, of course, when it's the right time and when your workloads show the variance for which you require auto-scaling. Now, putting all this together means that we should be now easily able to scale and handle 10 plus million users, or in fact to 11 million users and to infinity and beyond. And so that's what you would do to scale to 10 million users and beyond. Now, before we end this presentation, I wanted to also call out that Intel has been a great partner to run the underlying AWS infrastructure for us, especially the chipset for our compute instances. Through its relationship over the years, um, Intel has really provided the AWS customers with the latest and greatest Intel Xeon processors that help in delivering the highest level of processor performance in Amazon EC2. Apart from the usual benefits, Intel Xeon processors have several other technology features that can be leveraged by EC2 instances. Intel AVX, for example, is perfect for highly parallel HPC workloads such as life sciences or financial analysis. Then you have those Intel AES NI you know, chipset that accelerates encryption and decryption of data. Therefore, it reduces the performance penalty that usually comes with encryption. And then you also have the Intel Turbo Boost technology that automatically gives more computing power when your workloads are not fully utilizing all CPU cores. Just think of it as automatic overclocking when you have the thermal headroom. Now, the matrix on this slide highlights the individual Intel technologies and the EC2 instance families that can leverage each of these technologies. I'm not gonna go through the entire table, but if you need more information from this, just go to aws.amazon.com slash ec2 hyphen instance types slash, and you should get all the information there. There are also multiple channels for learning and ramping up via online trainings, instructor-led classes, preparing and going through our AWS certifications and more. So if you're new to AWS, I would encourage you to go through these channels to accelerate your learning paths. It's helped most of our customers before. Well, that's it from me for this session. I hope it was useful for you and you're ready to scale to the 10 million users running on AWS for your web app when you need to. Now, please do fill up your feedback survey, which would give us data points on what we did well and what we could do better for each of our sessions today and beyond. And as you can see, there are various channels to connect with us on email as well as on social media. Well, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the sessions for the day. That's it from me. That's my Twitter handle up there again for now. Goodbye from me. Cheers.